Welcome back to Bio 3D Prep, still on Unit 1, Properties of Matter in the Cell. Still talking about the properties of matter, still talking about structure, and now we're going to be spending our time talking about atomic properties and the formation of compounds. By the end of this lecture, you will be able to define valence electron and describe how valence electrons are involved in compound formation. You'll be able to describe how atoms interact to form ionic compounds, how they interact to form molecular compounds, and here we go. So if we take a look at just some patterns on the periodic table, or of elements on the periodic table, here we have the first 20 elements on the periodic table, and if we just take a look at the number of electrons in their outer energy level, or their valence energy level, what we'll see is that the number is the same. So if we look at these group 1 elements, we can see that the number of electrons in their valence shell is 1. Now they have the total number of electrons in each element is different, but once you get up to their outer energy level, their outer energy level has one electron in it. When we go to group 2, there's 2, group 13, there's 3, group 14, there's 4, group 15, there's 5, and so on, up to group 18. The only exception is helium, but if we take a look, all of the elements, this is group 18, this is our noble gases, here, all of our elements, oops, have a full valence shell, or valence energy level. So even though helium only has two electrons, its only energy level is the first one, and the first energy level can only have two electrons anyway, so its valence energy level is still full. So that's what this next statement says. The number of electrons in the valence energy level is the same within each group. And the number of electrons, we can even tell how many electrons are going to be in that group by looking at the group number. If the group number is less than 10, then the group number is the same as the number of electrons. So group 2 elements have 2 electrons in their valence energy level. For numbers greater than 10, the last digit of the group number tells us how many electrons are in that valence energy, valence energy level. So the halogens, group 17, all have 7 electrons in their valence energy level. And this goes on further down the periodic table as well, but right now we're just looking at those first 20 elements. So it turns out that the valence electrons are extremely important when we talk about chemical bonding. So chemical bonding occurs because atoms attempt to fill up their valence energy level, or they try to become more like noble gases. Noble gases don't react with anything because their valence energy level is full. All other elements try to get a full valence energy level, uh, thereby becoming like the nearest noble gas. So atoms with less than four valence electrons, which turns out to be our metals, metals have less than four valence uh, electrons, uh, it's easier for them to donate their valence electrons to get a full energy level. If you give away your outer electrons, then the next level on the inside, which is already full, becomes your valence energy level. So the lower, le the lower energy level is full, and then it becomes a valence energy level. So that's one way to fill up your valence energy level, is just to use the one that you already have. If you have more than four electrons, and these are all of our nonmetals, well then you're going to be taking electrons or sharing electrons. So in order to get up to that eight, if you have more than four, well then you only need to have maybe three, four, three or two or one more electron to get that full shell. So their goal is to get up to eight in their current valence energy level. When an atom donates or accepts electrons, it becomes an ion. Or what happens is, what we're doing is we're changing the number of electrons but the number of protons stays the same. What this means is now our element's going to have a charge. We're losing or gaining negative things, but the number of positive things we have stays the same, so our atom becomes an ion, or our atom becomes charged. 
And so that's the definition of an ion. Ions are atoms that have gained or lost electrons. What this means now is that atom is now going to have a charge, and we can call it an ion. And here's an example. If we take a look at calcium, if calcium were to lose two electrons, here's what would happen. If we draw calcium, I'll just draw an energy level diagram of calcium here. And to do that, I'm going to need my periodic table. And so, we have calcium. Calcium has an atomic or a mass number of 40, and an atomic number of 20, and its symbol is Ca. So when I draw my energy level diagram, here's my nucleus, and now it's going to be messy, but hopefully by now you realize that some of my writing is a little bit messy. So Look at that. Now we got to go and erase. So we'll go and erase. Here we go. Okay. So we know we have 20 protons. We know that there are 20 neutrons. There's our nucleus. Here's our atomic symbol, Ca. And now we'll fill in our electrons. So there's two on the first energy level. 8 on the next, that's 10. 8 more will give us 18. We need a total of 20, so we need 2 more up top. So there's our energy level diagram of calcium. If we lose 2 electrons, and the reason the calcium wants to lose 2 electrons is because it wants a full valence energy level. So if we lose 2, then this is going to become, this one's already full. And if it's already full, then if we just lose two, that becomes our new valence energy level. So when we lose two electrons, nothing else changes. We still have 20 protons. We still have 20 neutrons. But our electrons change. We still have two in the first energy level, eight in the next, 8 in the next, here's our new valence. Our new valence shell, our new valence energy level is now the third level instead of the fourth, and we're missing two electrons. If we take a look at our charge, we have 20 pluses, but we only have 18 negatives, which means our atomic symbol is going to change a little bit, and we're going to call it Ca. 2 plus because it has two extra positive charges. This is no longer a calcium atom, it's now a calcium ion. And it has different physical and chemical properties than a calcium atom because of this difference in charge. So when it comes to compounds, this is how compounds are made. Elements rarely exist in nature in their elemental form because only the noble gases are really happy with the number of electrons they have. Every other element is either trying to gain electrons or lo lose electrons to become stable. So by gaining or losing electrons, it becomes more stable. When, in order to gain or lose these, ele these electrons, it ends up forming bonds. Uh, bonds between the atoms occur in whole number ratios, and the type of bonding that occurs depends on the type of elements that are bonding. So let's take a look at what can happen when we have compounds involving metals. Now metals tend to com tend to combine with nonmetals, and these compounds are always solid at SATP. So one neat thing about these compounds is they're always solid. They're called binary ionic compounds, and binary ionic compounds consist of one type of metal bonded to one type of nonmetal. Uh, there's lots of examples. Table salt's one example. Uh, rust is iron oxide. Lye is sodium hydroxide. The first name is always the metal name. And the second name is usually the nonmetal. So this particular compound consists of sodium atoms and chlorine atoms. I guess ions would be a better way to say it. For nonmetals, it's a little bit different. They can combine with metals, like we just said, or they can combine with nonmetals as well. So nonmetals can combine with other nonmetals. It turns out that these nonmetal compounds can be solids, liquids, or gases 
at standard temperatures and pressures. So what this means is, if you see something that's gaseous, all gases and liquids at room temperature, if it's a compound, it has to be a non-metal compound or a molecular compound. Lots of examples as well, carbon dioxide, ammonia, uh, drinking alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, all of these things are molecular compounds, they're metals combined with other, or sorry, non-metals combined with other non-metals. Noble gases never bond to other elements. This is what makes them so special. They already have a full valence energy level. So, other elements want the same thing. So their goal is to achieve, achieve an octet, achieve a full energy level for their valence energy level. There's a bunch of ways to do it. Unstable atoms react with other atoms in ways of achieving stable valence. So it's all about electrons. Three ways to do it. You can lose electrons, you can gain electrons, or you can share electrons, all in order to fill that valence energy level. It depends on what kind of atom you are and who you're trying to make a bond with. Actually, I'll just go back one slide again. When we look at this, Losing electrons, this is always done by non-metals, or sorry, metals. Metals always lose electrons. Gaining and sharing, these are options for non-metals, depending on the situation. So that's who does what. The metals lose, non-metals can either gain or share electrons in order to get a stable or a full valence energy level. So ionic bonds, these are the bonds that are formed between a metal and a non-metal. And it turns out that all of the metals in our main group, those first 20 elements, and most of the metals on the periodic table, have less than four valence electrons. Or basically, it's always easiest to lose electrons. By losing electrons, they can get a full valence energy level. The non-metals always have four or more valence electrons, so for them, it's easiest to gain electrons. And so here we have this arrangement where one group of elements like one group of elements likes to lose electrons, the other one likes to gain electrons, and it can't get any easier than that. When one one when one of them runs into the other, electrons are transferred. So the metal is going to lose its electrons to the non-metal. There's a transfer. And so this is where we form ions. A transfer of electrons from the metal to the non-metal so that both of them can achieve a stable octet. When this happens, the positive ions are called cations. Non-metals go to form anions because they're negative. And now that we have these charged particles, they end up being attracted to each other. So they transfer electrons, and now we have a positively charged ion and a negatively charged ion, and so they're attracted to each other, and that attraction is called an ionic bond. The net charge of the compound is zero. So here's kind of how it works. Here, imagine a bunch of sodium, atom, sodium atoms colliding with a bunch of oxygen atoms. And we want to figure out, well, how are they going to transfer electrons so that both of them are happy? And so we'll start with sodium. So if we take a look at sodium, and I'm just going to write down, it's called a Lewis structure, but sodium has, or a dot diagram, one valence electron. So I'm going to write the sodium symbol and just write its valence electron above it. Sodium actually has 11 electrons total, but those first 10 are beneath the valence level. They're not involved in chemical reactions, so we don't need to worry about them when we talk about compound formation. When we look at oxygen, oxygen is in group 16, and so it has six valence electrons. And so we have a situation where sodium wants to lose, and oxygen wants to gain in terms of electrons, and that's exactly what's going to happen. Sodium, when they bump into each other, 
this electron is going to be transferred to the oxygen. And now what we have, I'm just going to put it in brackets here, is a sodium ion. It lost that one electron, it now has a positive charge, and it's happy. It has a full valence. Its second energy level has eight electrons. It's full. It's happy. When we look at oxygen, oxygen's happier, but it's not as happy as it could be. It now has seven valence electrons, so it still needs more. Now, the good news is atoms occur in groups, so you don't just have one sodium traveling randomly around, bumping into one oxygen. There's going to be a bunch of sodiums and a bunch of oxygens. Here we have another sodium atom. It can now donate its electron to that oxygen atom, and now we have another happy sodium. It got rid of its one little electron. It's happy. It has a positive charge now because it gave up a negative particle. When we take a look at oxygen, it's now happy as well. It has eight valence electrons. It gained two electrons, so it gained two negatives, so its charge is two negative. And now we have three happy ions. We have a sodium ion here, a sodium ion here, and an oxygen ion. And so atoms occur in groups of hundreds of millions all colliding together. It turns out that when sodiums and oxygens collide, they form a, co they form a compound called sodium oxide. And the atoms of sodium oxide are always two sodiums to one oxygen. When we write the chemical formula, we write it as a subscript after the symbol Na2O. And since there's only one O, we don't need to write the number in. But this would be the formula, which we're not going to spend a lot of time trying to build. That's more the realm of chemistry. But it doesn't hurt to recognize what they mean. You won't have to make any, but you should at least recognize that this compound has two sodiums and one oxygen. And there you go. That's how we predict the bonding ratio between a metal and a nonmetal. Covalent bonds. So we said that's how metals and nonmetals interact, but it turns out nonmetals can interact with each other. Nonmetals all have nearly full valence energy levels. So they all have almost eight electrons in their valence shell. So giving electrons up really isn't an option for them because they'd have to give up too many. Especially when we take a, like, take a look at like group 16 and group 17, even group 15, these have 5, 6, or 7 valence electrons. So they'd have to lose 5, 6, or 7 if they were going to lose. So it's easier to gain, but they can also share electrons in order to become happy. And here's what this looks like. If we take a look at oxygen, so if we want to predict the type of bond being formed, when we look at oxygen and nitrogen, we'll just draw our Lewis diagrams, or our dot diagrams. Here's oxygen, it has six. And nitrogen has five. And so since they both have more than four, we know that we're going to form covalent bonds. Or what we can say is they're going to share, oops, that should be an E. And we could predict the bonding ratio, but again, that's more the realm of chemistry, and we don't really want to spend time doing that. Uh, sulfur magnesium, on the other hand, sulfur, when we draw a picture of sulfur, sulfur is in group 16, so it has six electrons. Magnesium is in group 2, so it only has two electrons. Magnesium is more than happy to give them away, so here we're going to form an ionic bond. Another way we could look at both these questions is here we have a nonmetal and a nonmetal. When nonmetals join, we get covalent bonds. The other way we can look at the second one is we have a nonmetal and a metal. They're going to form ionic bonds. So, from this lecture, what you should get is that binary ionic compounds form when metal atoms collide with nonmetal atoms. When this happens, electrons are transferred from the metal to the nonmetal. The end compound has a zero charge, so 
the total number of electrons transferred is always equal. All ionic compounds are solid at standard temperatures and pressures. Binary molecular compounds are compounds that are composed of and for the binary. That means two types of nonmetal atoms or elements. Electrons are going to be shared. And again, the compound has a net charge of zero. So the only difference is one's a sharing process, one's a transfer process. And they end up making the compounds quite different, but those are the two choices that atoms have. They either transfer electrons or they share them. Molecular compounds have a greater variety in terms of state. They can be solids, liquids, or gases at standard temperatures and pressures. The ratio in which atoms arrange themselves is based on the octet rule, so everybody is trying to get a full valence energy level. And that's it for this one. I will see you in the next lecture.